All right. Bring it in. Have a seat, please. We'll get started this morning. Um, first of all, just a few announcements uh, as we get started. Um, May 23rd, we'll have a baptism. Uh, and uh, as I've said before, uh, if you have never been baptized and you are a born-again Christian, then it is something that Jesus has commanded us to do, to recognize uh, what has happened in our heart. And so it's an external display of that internal change that the Holy Spirit did in our lives. So please talk to myself or Pastor Randy, who's here today. Uh, Elder Andrew's not here. So anyway, if you haven't been baptized, reach out and we'll talk about that and we'll set it up for a future date. Also, uh, we have our men's gathering, Pursuit of Biblical Manhood, coming up uh, third Saturday of each month. So that'll be Saturday, May 15th, 8.30. Additionally, in a new announcement, and this is just a one-time hit here, but um, this Friday, uh, International Justice Mission at Cornell is sponsoring this uh, conference, and it's an online Zoom conference. The QR code there, if you want to register, you can go onto the website. But a uh, deeply important issue, human trafficking, and how that relates to pornography uh, today. So I encourage you to sign up for that. I think I'm going to be able to go. I'd like to hear what they have to say. Uh, so that's that. Yesterday we had our think together on uh, the issue of gender. It was a very robust conversation and a time in the word. Uh, to get to equip ourselves as best we could in uh, that issue. A lot of confusion today, and I think the Word of God brings clarity. So this morning, uh, what I want to attempt to do is to talk again about the resurrection. And the reason I'm doing that is because God said so. All right? Hopefully your pastor is hearing from God and being directed by his Spirit to bring words from the throne of heaven that will encourage us in our faith, to equip us in our faith. So all that to say that following Easter Sunday service, uh, as I processed through the week, I just felt like the Lord said, give my resurrection a little more attention because it is such a foundational and uh, important truth. So equip the church with the truth of the resurrection. So last week, we looked at the resurrection on kind of a personal level, and we looked at it from James's perspective, the Lord's half-brother James, who, you know, I won't repeat last week's sermon. I thoroughly enjoyed it. If you want to hear about it, you can go on the internet and, and pick that one off. So the resurrection from sort of a personal level, it was James coming to belief in Jesus as his, as his Savior. He had to change his relationship from, he's my human bro. <laughs> we lived together for like 30 years, shared a room, fought, played. Well, James fought, Jesus didn't fight. But, you know, all that to come to realize he's my king, he's my Savior, and I'm saved by his grace. That was really the, the crux of the message. Today, I want to consider the resurrection not so much from a personal level, but from a theological level. So, you know, you got your masks on, you're yawning right now behind your mask. Oh, theological perspective. It's actually very, very important, and I think it will meet and connect with your own heart. So, uh, to do that, please turn to Matthew 27. And I want to look at just a couple of verses, and we'll launch from Matthew 27, verse 51 to 53. So, uh, sorry, just welcome everybody who's online, too. I forgot to say that. Uh, we do have a few people that uh, tune in from uh, our live stream, so welcome. God bless you this morning. Matthew 27, 51. Let me start actually in verse 50. And we're here at a point where Jesus is on the cross, and it says in verse 50, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now, here's the main thing I want to look at. It says, Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earthquake and the rocks were split and the graves were opened, 
And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming up out of the graves, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So my thesis this morning is I just want to think with you about the tearing of the veil in the temple of God in Jerusalem. What does that tell us? And what does that mean for us today? It's actually hugely significant. The tearing of the veil, and notice it says from top to bottom. All right? So how do we know that, you might ask? Because if you have any familiarity, and I'll show you a few pictures here in a minute of what the temple looked like in Jesus' day. But if you have any familiarity with the temple there was uh, a curtain, a massive curtain called a veil, and it separated God from man for a good reason. It was sort of a a blockade for our well-being because he's holy and we're not. (laughs) And that, for that very reason, and really for that simple reason, there was this veil that separated man from God. That veil was torn from top to bottom. Now, how do we know? Well, I think one answer to that, probably the best answer, is in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it says, many of the priests came to faith. So, you know, after Jesus died, rose again, even when he went back to heaven, and for years until A.D. 70, when the temple was literally destroyed by the Roman army, until that time, the priests continued to go through all their ceremonial stuff there in the temple. So imagine... Either that night or the next day after Jesus is buried, the priest goes into the temple. Lo and behold, the veil is torn. (laughs) It's like, oh my God, you can't do this. How did they know it was top to bottom? I think, obviously, it tells us two things. God did that. He supernaturally tore this massive curtain, which was very thick, made of cloth. He tore it, and he tore it all the way down except for the last whatever amount, just to show that I did this. God did it divinely. They went from top to bottom. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells me that Jesus was doing the work of a high priest. And I want to talk with you a bunch about that this morning. That's what it's telling us. And hopefully by the time we're done, you'll appreciate that statement, that Jesus was doing the work of the high priest. What's it mean for us today? It means that the, it's the end of the law for righteousness. That's what it's very simply saying, that, yo, Judaism, all the ceremonial sacrifices and blood and washing and the, all that, guess what? Don't need to do that anymore. That never could make you right anyway. It was a temporary stay on my judgment that kept us in relationship But now we're putting an end to that. So it's the end of the law. It tells me that God justifies. That's what it tells me. And I guess I would say that really my point today is to teach us about what's it mean to be justified by faith. That's really what that means. This veil is torn from top to bottom. Jesus has done the work of the high priest It's the end of the law. There's a new way now to relate to God. He's establishing a new covenant. That's clearly what God is demonstrating here. He's approved of what his son has done, and he's torn the veil, and he's saying, come right in. You're welcome. Come right in. You don't even have to knock. It tells me that we're justified, which means sinners, Jew or Gentile, are reconciled to God. We're accepted. We have access, and there's affection. Those three A words are really good, make me cry at night when I think that I have, I'm acceptable to God because I know me. (laughs) It's hard for me to accept me, hard for my wife to accept me. She does because she's a gracious woman, right? But to be accepted by God who's holy, and then he would demonstrate that by tearing the veil, saying, you're acceptable, you have access because there's affection. Can you say that? Affection. Say affection. 
God loves you. Thank you, Lucas. <laughs> all right? You don't even have to knock any longer. Forget all the sacrificial stuff. That's why we don't sacrifice lambs today, friends, unless you're hungry and you like lamb chops. According to the Lehman or Lehrman Institute's website, uh, there's an interesting story about Abraham Lincoln. You all know Abe Lincoln, right? That um, he, when he was elected in office and put into the White House, uh, obviously his wife Mary and his sons came with him, but his younger son Thomas, who he called Tad, uh, you may know the story, but Tad had his own special code for entering his father's office. Three quick knocks and two slow bangs. But he needed no code to reach his father's tender heart. The president virtually refused to discipline or restrain his youngest son. Tad had free reign in the house and grounds, disrupting staff meetings and social occasions at will. Not so good. Here's my point. Noah Brooks wrote that I once was sitting with the president in the library when Tad tore into the room in search of something, and having found it, he threw himself on his father like a small thunderbolt gave him one wild, fierce hug, and without a word, fled from the room before his father could put out his hand to detain him. According to Assistant Secretary of War Charles Dana, often I sat by Tad's father, reporting to him about some important matter that I had been ordered to inquire into, and he would have this boy on his knee. And while he, Lincoln, would perfectly understand the report, the striking thing about him was his affection for the child. We are acceptable, we have access, because God is now my Father, and he has justified me. When I apply by faith the work of Christ to my own condition, my immoral, sinful nature, then I am justified by faith. What's it mean to be justified? It means that you are acquitted, you are made right, you are a guilty person becomes innocent. It's an act of God that he sovereignly puts on your life. And that gives us acceptance and access like little Tad. We can come running right into our father anytime. We don't need to knock. We don't need a special code. We have boldness to enter into the throne room of God because he's our father and there's affection. So that's all, that's what this means. It's very brief, but when the vow was torn, I want to draw our attention to that, and we're just talking about what's it mean for us and how significant that is. For us to understand the significance and the meaning, we need to get a picture, literally, that's your cue, Oz, of the structure of the old tabernacle or the temple. So there is a literal uh, life-size replica that is sitting somewhere in the land of Israel. Found that on the internet. So uh, you can see that there's a perimeter around. There's the uh, couple of articles there in the open square. And then there's an internal covered building, which is the inner tabernacle. And that's into two places. That's divided into two places. Next slide. So there's a cutaway of that inner tabernacle, and you can see it's sort of a dorky-looking picture, sorry. But, uh, you know, you see the priest standing in one part of the temple, and, but look, he's, there, he's facing a curtain. That's the veil, right? This is what God revealed to Moses. The temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness, is a revelation from God of, look, people, this is how we're going to relate but you can't come walking right into my presence. So for your safety, I'll put this curtain up behind. And behind the curtain then in the, is what is called the, the most holy place, or the holy of holies, is the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, next slide, please. So that, by the way, is a uh, life, well, it's a scale replica of the temple proper that uh, was there when Je in Jesus' time. That's actually a tourist attraction in Israel today. Uh, if there was a, a human standing right in that open square, uh, the Holy of Holies in that inner building would come up to about to his shins, okay? <laughs> just to give you a perspective. But people go and they walk around that. And it just, you, you can see, it's quite elaborate. 
It's got a perimeter wall. Um, and I'm talking really about the, the smaller perimeter wall around the, the temple proper. The bigger wall was built by uh, following Solomon's model. And whenever you read about Jesus going into the temple, he would go into that huge open courtyard, which was just, you know, a lot of activity out there. And that's where he would sit down and heal and talk and people would come to him. And, but uh, Jesus never actually, there's a close-up picture, thank you, Oz, of the temple area. And that big higher building is where the Holy of Holy is and the Holy Place. Okay, next slide gives us, um, that's an artist's rendition of what it might have looked like in the temple in Herod's day, in Jesus' time. So, again, um, altar of incense, candlestick, there's a table of showbread over here, and then, but what are you looking at? The big curtain. That's the veil, okay? That is a physical structure that existed in the Lord's day. That veil was torn top to bottom, all right? Indicating we are accepted, we have access, because there's affection from God, his love toward us. Um, to strengthen my point, go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. By the way, the book of Hebrews basically is a book about the priesthood of Jesus and how he brought in a new covenant. The priesthood of Jesus and how he brought in a new covenant. So Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. So this is, uh, it says, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in the earthly sanctuary. God bless you. <laughs> for a tabernacle was prepared. And he's actually now, um, he's referring, the author's referring, I believe, to Moses' tabernacle, the one that we saw that was sort of the crude one that was basically a movable, portable thing. The tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the holy place. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now, when these things were thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. Pause. Okay? In other words, the priest daily would go into the tabernacle where he would, thank you, Oz, he would light, he would put oil in the menorah and keep the candles stick burning. He would burn incense every morning and evening. That's what you read about in Luke chapter 1. Zacharias was doing the offering of the, uh, sacri uh, the prayers, the, the incense. And then over on the side, you see a table with a little bit of bread on it. And that represents the 12 tribes of Israel. So they'd go in every, every morning, every evening, keep the candle burning, and they'd offer incense. But only once a year would they go behind the curtain on the Day of Atonement. Only once a year. And that was only the high priest who was allowed to do that. All of his buddy priests would have the different functions of uh, the daily affairs. So back to our text, Hebrews 9, verse 6. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. And the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. He was concerned with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation, which is what Jesus did when he tore the veil. Verse 11 and 12, 
But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Okay? Hopefully we're a little bit more literate. Thank you for the pictures and the text. I think we got a sense, right? So God's presence was kept safe from man's sinful nature, holy, unholy. Only once a year was the mediator high priest allowed into that most sacred place. So I want to go with you now to the first time the high priest ever went into the most holy place. Let's go back into the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus 16. This is what's called the Day of Atonement. It's still observed by Jews to this day. It's called Yom Kippur. Atonement is basically the same thing as justification. It means you've done something wrong and you've got to fix it. <laughs> That's what atonement means, right? I've done something wrong and now I need to fix it. In human relationship, and just thinking about what does atonement mean, in human relationship, if you hurt someone... You need to restore the relationship. And hopefully there's a sense of conviction that's like, oh, man, I screwed up. So what do you do? Husbands, what do you do? You say, I'm sorry. Right? So do wives say that. So do friends say that. So do people in the church say that. You say those two little words that are so hard to get off our tongue. I'm sorry. And we don't say but. <laughs> We just say, no, I blew it. I'm sorry, right? I broke something. Now my, in an effort to make atonement for the broken relationship, I seek to make amends. That's what atonement means, okay? In our relationship with God, as sinful human beings, we've done countless things that are wrong based on his moral standards. And hence, we have a system that was put in place that God revealed to us called the tabernacle, and there's blood and water and all these things that he, we did, or they did, to make atonement. We basically be saying, we're sorry, God. <laughs> Please forgive us. That's what it is. So here we are in Leviticus 16, and before I start this, I, I'm just, I really want to get it set in our minds that based on what I read with you in Hebrews, Jesus fulfilled what this high priest Aaron is doing here in Leviticus. What Aaron did in a physical tabernacle Jesus did in a non-physical tabernacle, okay? Hence the tearing of the veil. It's saying it's finished, okay? And I'm telling you that because as I go through this briefly, I'm going to very casually start toggling back and forth between Aaron, who is the first high priest, and Jesus, who is the last high priest, Okay, so just stay with me on that. So first of all, there's a lot of drama. It's quite interesting. It says, now, chapter 16, Leviticus, verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. Now go back to chapter 10. I'll show you what just happened here. It brings a real soberness to Aaron the high priest. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1. <clears throat> it says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, which is a brass bowl container, put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Okay? Oh my gosh! <laughs> I, it, it doesn't say it, but I, I had the thought myself, and I, 
I read some, some other theologian, and, and what they think, what we think, is that Aaron's sons put this, they, they did something, they went in behind the veil. It seems like that's what happened. That they were so excited about being part of ministering in the church that they got all presumptuous and thought, we're connected to the high priest. I, I don't know what their motive was. I, I'm just trying to establish some suppositional thing here, but clearly they got in, they thought they could just come into God's presence, and God smoked them right there. It was like, oh my goodness, Aaron's boys are lying dead in that tabernacle. So, if you think you can just go to heaven without being justified, you're wrong. You have to be justified by faith in Jesus Christ, which comes from repentance and saying, cleanse me of my sin. So that's a very powerful message. So back to 16, and I won't go through all these verses with you. I'll just try to highlight a couple of things. But in Leviticus 16, now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. What do you think that did to dad? What do you think that did to him? Well, come on. Well, you know, what it, this is like, this is a hazardous job. <laughs> He's like, God is now going to call Aaron. He's saying, now, I want you to come in behind the veil. He's like, oh, my goodness. It put a fear of God in his heart, no doubt. A holy reverence for him and for his holiness and his character. And the Lord said to Moses in verse 2, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. And he shall put on this special clothing. He describes it in the next couple of verses. Verse 6, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. You see, Aaron was a man. He was a sinner. Before he could enter into God's presence and do the work of a mediator, he himself had to seek forgiveness. Brother and sister, Jesus never had to do that. He was innocent, tried, and found guiltless of all sin. Okay? So our analogy has a little bit of a breakdown right there, but it makes sense. Aaron's a man. He's a sinful man. Uh, so God said you do this first for yourself. Verse 7, he shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be pre presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. Now, rather than read the next several verses, let me tell you what happens. Aaron, right, we've all seen the picture. Aaron's about to go in behind the veil. He actually goes in behind the veil three times. The first time, he goes in with one of those little brass bowls full of hot coals and a handful of incense. And as near as I can tell, he's holding on, probably got a chain, right, the bowl suspended from a chain because it's hot, and he's got this handful of incense. And so he approaches, he comes into the holy place, and there's the curtain. And so I'm guessing he kind of does one of these things, right? Gets the curtain out of his way, and now he's standing there in the presence of God, and he throws the incense on the coals. And it's, it's a type of prayer, and it fills the room with this incense. Then he backs out of that holiest place, and he goes out and he gets the blood from the bull, and he has some blood in the little bowl, and he comes in, and he gets in there in the Lord's presence, and he puts his finger in the blood, and he sprinkles blood 
on the mercy seat seven times, and then seven times in front of the mercy seat. He backs out, goes out and takes the blood of the goat, which is the offering for the sin of the people. And here's the key, okay? He now has an offering that is there for the sin of the people. So what's happening? We have one man who's mediating for all the people. And he's going into the presence of God with the blood of an offering, which is to make atonement. We've done wrong. We want to get back in a good relationship with you, God. Please forgive us. So here he is in these, behind that veil the third time with the blood of the goat. Same thing, finger seven times on the mercy seat, seven times in front of the mercy seat. Do you remember his two sons? What happened to them? Anybody? Aaron's two sons. They died. <laughs> so here's my thing. Aaron goes in behind that veil three times. Now, what's happening outside of the temple, outside of the whole tabernacle proper, the, all the people are looking to the mediator, this one high priest, and they're going, I hope you do it right. Because if you don't do it right, you're going to die. <laughs> Just like your boys did. All their hope for their relationship with God was put entirely on the, on the back of Aaron. It was his lone job, and he's got to do it right. If he doesn't do it right, he dies. That's the point. So let me ask you, my friends, and here's my punchline. How do we know if what Jesus did for us as a high priest, how do we know if his offering for our sin was accepted by God? The answer, the same way all the people knew if Aaron did his job right, he comes back out alive. If Aaron doesn't come back out alive, his offering for my sin was not acceptable to God. But if he comes back out alive, whoo -hoo -hoo, I'm alive because my high priest is alive. And what he offered on my behalf was accepted by God. I'm forgiven. And I'll prove it to you. Look at verse 15. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And so he'll make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Verse 17, here it comes. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out. Until he comes out. In other words, once Aaron has successfully mediated, been the one man who's mediated for the sin of all the people on one day, covering the sin of all the people for all that year. Once he's gone in and he successfully does it, he comes back out. Now we know it's accepted. And what's that mean? Now we can go in. That's what it says. That's God prophetically revealing to us in this Old Testament system what Jesus was going to do. It's what the writer of Hebrews was saying to us in Hebrews 9. The power of the resurrection and the tearing of the veil is so significant. As we can see, man, you can't go behind that veil and come into God's presence unless you've been made right with God. Even the high priest couldn't do that. And the only way anybody knew if Aaron had done it successfully was when he came back out. And that's what it says. Nobody could be in there until he comes out. When he comes out, we know that it was accepted by God. And you see it, my brothers and sisters? When the vow was torn, that little verse, that little statement in Matthew 27, 51, 
It now teaches us that Jesus, what he's accomplished is my high priest. It's like, why did God tear the veil? Jesus wasn't even in the temple. He wasn't even in the city. They took him out of the city. He died on a hill called Golgotha on the north side of the city. But why does the writer and Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us the same thing? What Jesus did out on that cross, it had an, an effect on the worship of the people in the temple. It's telling me he's my high priest, that God is the one who justifies. You believe, you repent of your sin, believe in Jesus Christ, you're born again. God's like, come right in. Just like Tad Lincoln. That's my daddy in there. I don't care what's going on. I want X, and Abe would just bring him in. Have a seat, son. There's acceptance. We're made acceptable by God. The power of the resurrection. That's what I'm preaching to you this morning. The power of the resurrection. God has justified you by faith. He's taken a guilty person, and he's in one head spinning moment taking you from guilt conscience to just transformed by faith. One of the most powerful scenes in the movie Les Miserables. <laughs> if you know that book or that movie, Victor Hugo, right? That whole movie turns on one scene early in the movie where Jean Valjean, who's an ex-convict, destitute, living on the street, Sleeping on a park bench, somebody said, and he's starving, he's in rags. He has nothing but a scraggly clothes on his back. And some passerby says, why don't you go down to the man of God down in the corner and knock on his door? Maybe he'll give you a little help. Great story, right? Jean Valjean knocks on the, high pri on the priest's off door. Man questions him. He, just basically, he brings him in, he gives him food, and he gives him a room to stay, a lodging. Took a risk with this guy, Jean Valjean, the priest did. Fascinating story. Hugo knew, he knew Christianity. He knew this doctrine that we're talking about because in the middle of the night, Jean Valjean gets up, goes down to the priest's cupboard and takes his knapsack and fills it with the man's solid silver, worth a lot of money. He just stole all of his stuff. While he's doing that, the priest wakes up because he hears a little commotion, goes down, he sees Valjean, Valjean hits him, assaults the guy, he's lying on the floor, Valjean takes his knapsack and runs out in the middle of the night. The cool story is that in the morning, the law had found the thief. He was guilty. They dragged him back before his judge, the priest. He's standing there in front of the priest with handcuffs, and the evidence of the silver in the knapsack. And the policeman just sort of funny, he's got a little smirk on his face, and he goes, is this your silver? Yeah. Yeah, well, he told us you gave it to him. And the priest looked Valjean in the eye, and then he looked at the police officer, and he said, I did give it to him. He's like, you mean he told the truth? Yeah, I gave it to him. He, this priest took his silver, and the police, once he, once he declared him innocent, they took the handcuffs off the, the guilty thief. They took the handcuffs off the man. The police go away, and the priest is standing there. Now he's looking at the man who had offended him, who had assaulted him and stolen and violated him. And the priest looked at him, and he puts, shoves that silver, bag of silver in his hand. He actually added more to it. And the priest said, don't forget. Don't ever forget. You've promised to be a new man. And Valjean said, why are you doing this? He said, Jean Valjean, my brother, you are no longer belong to evil. With this silver, I have bought your soul. I have ransomed you from fear and hatred, and now I give you back to God. That is justification. That man standing there caught, red-handed, handcuffs, the law declaring you're guilty. But the only man who had the power to forgive him just showed mercy, and he said, 
you're forgiven. In one head-spinning moment, Valjean went from, I, need, I deserve death, to I am now alive. That's justification. That is justified by faith. Don't ever forget it. That's who we are in God's eyes. That's the standing that we have with him. Immovable because of the covenant that he's placed upon us. So, final application. What do we do about this? Go to Acts or Romans chapter 8, and we'll close up with here. Romans chapter 8. It's been fun to bounce around a little bit in the Old and New Testament this morning. Romans chapter 8, and I'll pick it up at verse 30. Oh, Spirit, drive this into our hearts. Romans 8, verse 30. Everybody there? All right, here it is. Moreover, whom he, God, predestined, these he also called. Now notice, whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I'm going to give you three words, four words that begin with the letter V. Based on Paul answering his question with another question, and based on the fact that if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, and I hope you have, then that torn veil is so near and dear and precious to you and me. That means I come boldly into the throne of my Father because of what my high priest Jesus has accomplished for me. I am as guilty as they come. Every sin, nameable, recognizable to man I have committed or I'm capable of committing. And yet he has justified me only because of his love and his mercy. And he's put a pile of silver into my life and he said, now I've made you rich with my nature. I put my spirit upon you. And Paul now starts asking some really good questions. What shall we say to these things? And the first thing he answers that question with a question, he said, if God is for us, who can be against us? My brothers and sisters, be valiant for the truth. Be valiant for the truth. I love how that really took a, took a hold yesterday in our conversation about how do we engage with a culture that is anti-Christ, that has an entirely different worldview, that calls right wrong and wrong right. And one of the things that we came back to was, man, this truth that God has planted in my heart, I'm not moving off of center on that because I know that he loves me. Like we sang the song, he is with me. So I can be valiant. I can hear, I can receive all kinds of remarks and accusations that aren't true. Be valiant for the truth. Paul goes on in verse 32, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Do you see what Paul's saying there? He goes, not only can you be valiant, you can actually venture out into a life of faith. God's going to provide. You're going to get out there into places where, I don't know, Lord, what am I doing out here? Like Peter walking on the water. The Lord's like, keep your eyes on me. Venture out. Be valiant and venturesome. Come on, church, please, Lord, Scott, I, I want to do this. I want to be living outside of my comfort zone. It ought to just be a natural, the church ought to be living on the water all the time because we're supernaturally given life and we supernaturally operate in the spirit. And it's out there that we see God meet the need because it's outside of us. He who's begun a good work in you, he's going to complete it until the day of Christ. Verse 33, Paul asks another question. Who shall lay a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Oh my goodness, we're vindicated. <laughs> Valiant, venturesome, vindicated. It is God who justifies. People will see your behaviors and they'll put trips on you that you don't deserve. 
Or they'll just think, that dude is gone, man. He's got so many problems. It's like, they don't know what's going on inside of the heart. And you hear those voices. Maybe the voices are in your own head. They're not outside of you. Or maybe it's the devil just breathing his lies and threatenings upon you. And it's so easy to get caught in that trap. Discouragement. A friend of mine said, it's hard to hit a curveball. Devil's a specialist, man. He can throw a wicked curve. I can't hit a curveball for the life of me. I can barely hit a softball. The level just throws that thing of discouragement. Boom, can't hit that, weakling. No, no, no. It is God who justifies. The Holy Spirit has borne witness to me. I am his. He is mine. I'm vindicated. Don't you think Jean Valjean and our little fictional story had to deal with that? By the time he walks away from that priest, he's got this bag of silver, and he's a very, very wealthy man. And that's what takes the course of his life change, and that's what the whole rest of the movie is about, how he's just merciful to so many other people, using what God had given him for the sake of others. Change the course of that man's life. Has Jesus changed the course of your life? Have you met him personally? Have you walked in behind the veil? <laughs> Have you enjoyed the presence of God as he filled you with love, love and joy and peace that is under, you can't ex describe what happens. You just sometimes lie there with tears just rolling down your face. There's just so much peace and it's, Lord, I'm so undeserving and you're so beautiful. Vindicated. But that gets set in your heart. Basically, he repeats himself. Verse 34, I think it's such a big deal. He says, who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died. Furthermore, is also risen, even at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. Still vindicated. And then third, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Nope. <laughs> verse 37, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him. We're valiant, we're venturesome, we're vindicated, we're victorious based on what he's done. <laughs> well, comments, thoughts? Love to talk with you more if you have questions. Pray with you and, and just, oh, I pray that we will know the Lord. <laughs> that whole tabernacle thing, that's a revelation from God. That's a revelation from God. He did that. Moses didn't make that up. God told him to do that. God told him to do that. Because God loves people. He loves sinful people. And he, he made a way that we could have a relationship with him. Part of, the, part of that process is giving us a law. I think the law, the Ten Commandments, is one of the most loving things God ever did. Second, maybe, to Jesus dying on a cross. Because by the law is the knowledge of sin. I'm in trouble. Once the law got put cuffs on Valjean, he's like, I'm screwed. There's no hope except for a merciful priest. Let's stand and pray. Lord, to take a walk through this study this morning and to see the veil torn and what that means for us, Lord, it changes everything. Jew or Gentile can now come based on the accomplished work and the resurrection of Jesus. You came back out alive. You offered your life, Jesus, as the atoning sacrifice for our sin. It was accepted. It satisfied the righteous wrath of God. We know that because you're alive and you're alive in me. Lord, put feet on us in this issue that we will actually live this out now 
in a valiant and venturesome and vindicated, victorious way. That nothing can separate us from the love of God. Pour your spirit out, Lord, and bless your church. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.